loving and gracious Father in heaven, we thank thee that we can come before thee on the Friday evening, on the Sabbath day. We thank thee, Lord, for the past week and for all the blessings that you've given. We thank thee, Lord, that you've chosen such a group as this, your sons and daughters, because of uh, your dear son who is faithful to call us his own. Lord, we're not worthy of the things that uh, Jesus has done for us. I know I'm not worthy, and we want to all thank Thee uh, through Jesus, and we want to plead the blood of Jesus tonight, that uh, because of Him, Lord, uh, You would give us more of Thy Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit, Lord, would be to us so precious that we would do nothing to offend Him, and that we would... Uh, do as Billy said the other day, that we would uh, decide not to do it our way, but to give to him our will and our hearts. Please bless Jeff tonight. Uh, may we, he be hid in uh, dear Jesus, and may we see uh, the sweet and lovely Jesus as we uh, continue our study tonight. And thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Um, I have, I think, six more studies to get through before the Prophecy School is, is finished. We're not sure how many times Steve is going to speak tomorrow, if at all, or what, what his desire are, and uh, of course Russell's going to speak again. So we still um, have some ground to cover, and as, we, as I looked over this material, this will be in one sense, some of the most difficult, and the purpose of this study is to put in the record of this prophecy school, particularly on the tapes that are being recorded, the pioneers' understanding of the trumpets, um, so that we can draw some of those truths that the pioneers came to understand and bring them down to a study of the final trumpet. Um, we're going to look at the the, all the trumpets, but uh, the present truth message for this day and age includes the last trumpet, the third woe, and in order to understand the third woe, I believe we have to understand the first and second woe. So <clears throat> in some senses, when I, when I was putting this together, one of the burdens I had is that um, when this prophecy school was all said and done, if we had it recorded, that it had potential of going into people's homes that may not have access to the, <coughs> the pioneer writings like most of us probably do. So I wanted to put um, a great, in this particular study is when I wanted to put a great deal of text into, you, into the record. And uh, so it's a lot of reading more than typically we've been doing. So let's get started, okay? The book of Revelation in connection with the book of Daniel especially demands our study. Education, page 191. Study the Revelation in connection for Dan with Daniel for history will be repeated. Testimonies to Ministers, 116. I really agree with A.T. Jones here. The establishment, the growth, and the reign of the papacy as a world power is distinctly a subject of prophecy as really as is the fall of Rome and the planting of the ten kingdoms upon the rooms thereof. Indeed, the prophecy of this is an inseparable part of the prophecy of the other. And A.T. Jones is saying, if we're going to understand papal Rome, we need to understand pagan Rome and the ten kingdoms and their disintegration into the seven kingdoms. And I agree with that a hundred percent. You can't study the papacy fully as you are supposed to, I believe, unless you understand pagan Rome. In fact, you, we need to understand Babylon, Greece, Medo-Persia, all of them. But uh, the two Romes are what illustrate modern Rome. Let's start with Revelation 8, verse 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Revelation 8, 6. Um, 
I don't remember my notes on the following studies. I'm going to be in the trumpets here for the next four presentations. I think I took time to go back into the seven churches and the seven seals, uh, which there, in my mind, we cannot logically and completely and fully understand the seven trumpets without understanding the seven churches and the seven seals because these are three parallel histories that must be applied together. And it's under the opening of the seventh seal that the seventh trumpets begin to sound. But we are jumping right into the seventh trumpets. The seventh trumpets are divided into two divisions, basically. The first four trumpets are trumpets. They tell the providential history of how the barbarian powers out of the north and the Vandals out of northern Africa began to take the Roman Empire apart piece by piece um, right after Rome was divided into two parts when the capital of Rome was moved from the city of Rome to Constantinople. That's the first four trumpets. By 476, uh, the capital of Western Rome, the city of Rome, was under full control of those barbarian powers. The next three trumpets are woes, and the first of those uh, two woes, the fifth and sixth trumpet, uh, begin to tell the story of how Eastern War Rome is brought down, including Papal Rome during that time period. And those histories run parallel, they overlap to the history of the seven seals and the seven churches, and they cannot be intelligently understood without looking at all those lines of prophecy together. And certainly, um, those lines of prophecy has to be incorporated with the same history that's found in the book of Daniel. But we are starting with the seven trumpets. The subject, this is Daniel and Revelation, Uriah Smith. The subject of the seven trumpets is here resumed and occupies the remainder of this chapter and all of chapter 9. The seven angels prepare themselves to sound. The sounding comes in as a complement to the prophecies of Daniel 2 and 7, com commencing with the breaking up of the old Roman Empire into its ten divisions, of which in the first four trumpets we have a description. The first four trumpets, the first Sunday laws by Constantine in 321, national apostasy is followed by national ruin. And nine years later, Constantine moved the capital to Constantinople and the end of pagan Rome's time period to rule the world just supremely had come and the empire begins to crumble. The first uh, trumpet, the pioneer's mark is Alaric, arrives in 395 and in 410, the city of Rome was taken. The next trumpet, uh, the Vandals, Genseric, 428, 40, 468. The third trumpet, Attila the Hun, from 433 to 453. Um, and Odiacer conquered and brought the final demise of Western Rome in 476. This history parallels the first three seals, which culminates in 533 when Justinian gave his authority to the papacy. It is worth noting that this history culminates at this point, the four uh, first four trumpets are coming to a conclusion in the 533-538 time period. Um, the fifth and sixth trumpet, Muhammad is raised up in the, not in the fifth, and, yeah, the fifth and sixth trumpet. Muhammad is raised up in the first woe um, to be, as the pioneers uh, called it, um, a scourge for the apostate church. When the apostate church gets established in 538, Muhammad is raised up right during that a time period to, sta to start to deal with the apostate church. Um, why is it important to uh, mark these time periods? One of the reasons it's important to mark these time periods, um, we're going to show as we proceed that the first four trumpets that's dealing with Western Rome um, culminates when Justinian gives his kingdom away to the papacy in 533, and then in connection with uh, that event, five years later, his kingdom um, is no more in terms of the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. Um, the papacy then becomes the fifth kingdom of Bible prophecy, whereas the first and second woe end with the same dynamic. Uh, when a king gives his kingdom away, shortly thereafter, his kingdom is divided up, parceled out, taken apart. Uh, we are going to get to a point in our study, Lord willing, tomorrow on the Sabbath day, where we will show that this history of the first six trumpets um, has a contribution to make in the correct understanding of the last six verses of Daniel 11 in identifying uh, the fact that the fourth trumpet, the first woe, and the second woe come to a conclusion with the dynamics of a king giving his kingdom away and then shortly thereafter being swept away is a prophetic 
uh, marker that I would like you to pay, pay attention to here and hold in your mind uh, because when we start showing that uh, the trumpets have some light to shed on Daniel 11, um, we will deal with that dynamic in those verses. The first woe. This is a summary that I have put together. Um, and the reason for this is I pulled some of the, the things that the pioneers would um, confirm, but I put them into, I've taken out the, the, the points out of that pioneer position that seem of significance to me, particularly when we get into Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45. And you may be asking yourself, how could we possibly be looking at the trumpets and expect to get back into Daniel 11, verse 40 and 45? And just to uh, try to spark your curiosity along that line, when the angel came down out of heaven in Revelation 10, he had a little book open. What was that little book? Daniel. Um, when did he come down? 1840. When? You, you're close. Narrow it down. August 11th, 1840. The angel comes down out of heaven with a little bit open in his hand. We all, can we all say amen to that? Okay. Now, what, what prophetic understanding brought the angel down? It didn't bring the angel down, but what prophetic understanding brought Christ down on August 11th, 1840? Pardon me? A fall of the Ottoman Empire, correct? And it confirmed the year-day principle. That's correct. That's what brought the power. But where do we get uh, the fall of the Ottoman Empire from out of the Bible? Revelation 9.15. But Christ came down, and he had the little book of Daniel open in his hand, didn't he? Well, what's this got to do with the book of Revelation? It was Revelation 9, 15. But he had the little book of Daniel, and we've been telling you that all week long. You, you see, there's the, although we know the books of Daniel and Revelation are the same book, there is kind of a difference there, isn't it? The, the Revelation is what was used to bring power to the movement, but how did it bring power to the movement? Because it connected a passage in Revelation with the book of Daniel, the year-day principle. And that's what we're seeing because what we're saying to you is when we conclude with our study of the woes, hopefully we will show you that once again, a passage in the book of Revelation makes a connection with the book of Daniel. And this is one of the power points of this little book being opening in our day and age. So some of these points here that we're going to make that are taken out of pioneer understanding of the trumpets, we will need as we approach the conclusion of this study. So, what am I saying? The first woe wo was this. It was Arabic Islam. Why am I saying Arabic Islam? Because the history of the first woe places the rise of Islam in Arabia. But the second woe, uh, the focus of Islam is going to move into Turkey, what we call the Ottoman Turks. And there's a distinction between Turkish Islam and Arabic Islam, and the pioneers understood this. This isn't my own... Um, view of it. There, there's a movement there. Um, it is a power of, of the bottomless pit. Um, one of the characteristics is, is that it's sudden and violent in nature. Islam during that time, one of the characteristics that's portrayed in the prophecy and that the pioneers understood, um, they strike suddenly and they are violent. Um, the key to the rise of um, Islam, uh, Brother Russell has been dealing with a little bit, and it's worth noting this. This is important to see. It's a prolonged war uh, between Rome and Persia, between two powers, a prolonged war culminating with the Battle of Nineveh. If you remember his chart, the reason, I mean, he has, he, what his charts are to me is what, what I understand the word to be busy. He has some very busy illustrations on his PowerPoint. But if you walk through them, they're very solid. And he wasn't just taking the the road up and across and then down for the Battle of Nineveh because it seemed like a, a, you know, a nice thing to do for his chart, that he was actually tracking uh, the geographical passage that Rome made in order to come in the back door in the Battle of Nineveh. And the Battle of Nineveh, the pioneers defined as the key that opened the bottomless pit and allows uh, Islam to come in and... and we need to mark the Battle of Nineveh. We need to mark a prolonged war between East and West. 
Um, they were to torment, uh, Arabic Islam in the first war were to torment and hurt the beast that was. What do I mean by the beast that was? What do I mean by that? What's, what's the beast that was here? Here in Revelation 17, when John standing here, the beast that was, was papal Rome. But in the history that we're dealing with in the time period of the first woe, the beast that was, was pagan Rome. Papal Rome was, was on the throne of the earth, okay? So I want you to be clear about that distinction. If I was to place you in this history between Medo-Persia and Greece and ask you what's the beast that was at that point, what piece, beast would it be? Medo-Persia. So that, I'm taking that phrase um, from Revelation 17, and it, it works, and it's important to recognize it, that the reason that Islam comes up at this point in the first woe is they are to torment and hurt the beast that was, Eastern pagan Rome, and the beast that is papal Rome during that time period. They were not to hurt those who had the seal of God, but they were hurt to hurt or torment for five months. We have a time prophecy um, in the first woe. We have a time prophecy in the second woe. We will not have a time prophecy in the third woe, even though we're going to suggest to you that um, the characteristics of the first and second woe are what are going to illustrate and identify the third woe. But we've been saying all along that pagan Rome and papal Rome illustrate modern Rome, and they both had time prophecies connected with them, and neither will modern Rome have a time prophecy connected with it, because one of the things that Jesus did when he came out of, out of heaven in Revelation 10 with the little book open in his hand, what did he do? He said, time will be no longer. Prophetic time comes to its end, October 22nd, 1844. They were to torment for five months, 150 years, beginning with the Battle of Nicodemia, July 27th, 1299. This is the beginning of the Ottoman Empire, Turkish Islam, um, which is going to, Turkish Islam is going to be the focus of the second woe. They have a king over them who is the angel of the bottomless pit, um, had a question in here between not this last presentation and the one before that. Uh, not a question, but a statement about, uh, you know, who is this um, destroyer that is um, Apollyon and uh, Abaddon. And uh, they both mean destroyer um, in the Hebrew and the Greek. Who's the destroyer in the Hebrew and the Greek? And uh, that the person that was making that comment was saying that the destroyer is Satan, and, and but we'll move on with that. I want to make the note, note of this king over them, who is the angel of the bottomless pit. The first woe concludes when the last emperor of Eastern Rome, John Pelagios, left his throne to his son Constantine. Constantine refused to accept the throne without permission of the Turkish power, which at that time had grown into strength. Then he ascended to the throne in 1449, once he received permission in May 1453. The, the Turks took, his, took Constantinople anyway. So we see here the same dynamics of Justinian giving his kingdom away, and five years later his kingdom was gone. Here um, Constantine gave his kingdom away in 1449, and it was wiped out four years later. Okay, this is Uriah Smith. After the death of Muhammad, he was succeeded in the command by Abu Bekr, 632. This is talking the history of the beginning in the first woe, who as soon as he had fairly established his authority and government, dispatched a circular letter to the Arabian tribes from which the following is an extract. When you fight the battles of the Lord, acquit yourself like men without turning your backs. And uh, here Uriah Smith, so you know what I'm reading about, is talking about the passage where in the first woe they were commanded not to hurt those men that had the seal of God. This is an important point, I believe, in the first woe that we, we want to nail down for ourselves. When you fight the battles of the Lord, acquit yourselves like men without turning your backs, but let not your victory be stained with the blood of women and children. Destroy no palm trees, nor burn any, nor burn any fields of corn. Cut down no fruit trees, nor do any mischief to the cattle, only such as you kill to eat. When you make any covenant or article, stand to it, and be as good as your word. And as you go, you will find some religious persons who live retired in monasteries and propose themselves to serve God that way. Let them alone and neither kill them nor destroy their monasteries. And you will find another sort of people that belong to the synagogue of Satan 
who have shaven crowns, be sure you cleave their skulls and give them no quarter till they either turn Mohammedans or pay tribute. Now, we were talking about this, a group of us, a few days ago. And all we were remembering is that they get their head cut off. But one of the identifying marks of the ones that get their heads cut off is they had shaven crowns. Uh, that's, anyway, <laughs> it has nothing to do with it. But anyway, we did have a discussion about that. It is not said in prophecy or in history that the more humane injunctions were as scrupulously obeyed as the ferocious mandate, but it was so commanded them. And the preceding are only instructions recorded by Gibbon as given by Abu Bakr to the chiefs whose duty it was to issue the commands to all the Saracen host. And the Saracen host is what I'm calling Arabic Islam. The commands are alike discriminating with the prediction as if the caliph himself had been acting and known as well as direct obedience to a higher mandate than that of the mortal man in the very act of going forth to fight against the religion of Jesus and to prop propagate Mohammedism in its stead. He repeated the words which it was foretold in the revelation of Jesus Christ that he would say. In remarks upon chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, we have shown that the seal of God is the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, and history is not silent upon the fact that there have been observers of the true Sabbath throughout all through the present dispensation. But the question here has arisen with many. Who were those men at this time that, who were the men who at this time had the seal of God in their foreheads, and who thereby became exempt from Mohammedan Oppression. Let the reader bear in mind the fact, already alluded to, that there has been those all through this dispensation who have had the seal of God in their foreheads. And Sister White, by the way, says there's been Enoch's in every age. Or have been intelligent observers of the true Sabbath, and let them consider further that what the prophecy asserts is that the attacks of the desolating Turkish power are not directed against them, but against another class. So the argument Uriah Smith is going to make here is that there really is not a whole lot of historical evidence that there was Sabbath keepers uh, that were protected by uh, Arabic Islam, but the verse, he's not, he's not arguing that there were Sabbath keepers protected, and he's saying what he's wanting to emphasize, it, it's clear that they were directed against those that were not Sabbath keepers. That's the point that he's wanting to make. And uh, I didn't listen, I haven't heard the two presentations that we've listened to on video here um, from Brother Dickey, but I've listened to ones a while ago, and sometimes, and maybe on those, maybe not, he points out that uh, in the Quran, um, the Quran teaches that the reason that um, the Jews of old apostatized was because they broke the Sabbath. I mean, you, you, have, to, you have to understand the terminology of the Quran, but it's clear uh, that where they, that the Quran teaches that the Jews broke the covenant of God by breaking the Sabbath, and it's clear in the Quran that the Christian Church broke its covenant with God when it kept quit keeping the Sabbath. Both those truths are in there, and so it's it's a truth that Uriah Smith is dealing with here too. This the subject is thus freed from all difficulty, for this is all that prophecy really asserts. Only one class of person is directly brought to view in this text, namely, those who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And the preservation of those who have the seal of God is brought in only by implication. Accordingly, we do not learn from history that any of these were involved in any of the calamities inflicted by the Saracens upon the objects of hate. Um, and he describes who it's focused on, and here's who he's saying the, the command of destruction or submission is focused on, he says, these were doubtless a class of monks or some other division of the Roman Catholic Church. Against these, the arms of the Mohammedans were directed, and it seems to us that there is a peculiar fitness, if not design, in describing them as those who had not the seal of God in their foreheads, inasmuch as that, it, as that is the very church which has robbed the law of God of its seal by tearing away the true Sabbath and erecting a counterfeit in its place. And we do not understand either from the prophecy or from history that those persons whom Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr charged his followers not to molest were in possession of the seal of God or necessarily constituted the people of God. Who they were and for what reason they were spared, the meager testimony of Gibbon does not inform us. Nevertheless, God's word notes that in the first woe, um, they were not to hurt those that have the seal of God, and this has an impact on the reflection that the, the woes cast upon Daniel, 
11, verses 40 to 45. The second woe, Turkish Islam, which is also still the same power, a power from the bottomless pit. It's sudden and violent in nature also, but here, in this part of history, gunpowder is invented, so we have an emphasis on the use of gunpowder, explosives. They were not simply to torment the beast that was, they were to kill the beast that was, Eastern pagan Rome. During this time, the beast that is papal Rome was also slain. A characteristics to mark down when we get to part four, I think, of this study, maybe part five. It begins where the first woe ends, starting the 391 years, 15-day time prophecy. It begins when the four angels are loosed. Where does the first woe end? It ends at the end of the 150-year time prophecy, the five months. And when the 150-year time prophecy ends, the second woe begins, 391 years, 15 days. It ends with the identical dynamics as Justinian and the last Emperor Constantine when the Pasha of Turkey submits his empire into the hands of the four powers of Europe. Um, as as uh, Russell articulates it, and I like the way he articulates it, it reached a point where the European powers were deciding the fate of Islam. And of course, the European powers, who are the European powers? Well, the European powers are the descendants of pagan Rome. The seven European kings, descendants of pagan Rome. They are, <clears throat> in that sense, they are uh, the, the blood lineage of the dragon power. And here at the end of the world, we're going to have a dragon power, the United Nations, that will once again be involved with descend determining the fate of Islam. So we want to mark this here, that the four great powers of Europe were placed into the hands that Turkey was placed into the hands of the four great powers of Europe. This situation was created by Turkey's loss of power combined with the threat of Arabic Islam Egypt taking control of the former Ottoman Empire, forcing the four great powers of Europe to intercede. Shortly thereafter, the powers of Europe parcel out the former empire of the Ottomans. Now, it's not really shortly thereafter. Um, it's during, it's, uh, it comes to its conclusion in August 11th, 1840, and the Ottoman Empire gets Turk parceled out during the First World War time period. So you're looking at 70-some years. But it is really shortly thereafter. It really is shortly thereafter because um, it came to its end on August 11th, 1840, which is only four years before 1844. And things could have came to a conclusion if God's people would have followed on by faith. The fact that time was moved on is due to the disobedience of God's people. So, that's, so though it is much longer time before their kingdom is parceled out, it can be understood by understanding um, how prophecy has been delayed due to the disobedience of God's people. We're going back now into the first four trumpets. And, Re and Uriah Smith quotes Revelation 8, 8 7. The first angel so sounded, and there fall followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and a third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the grass was burnt up. And I, we are going to read about this third part of the earth. Um, if you remember, at some point in time, I suggested to you that the pioneer understanding of pagan Rome, which we started with, A.T. Jones says is uh, important to understand if we're going to understand papal Rome. The pioneer understanding is of pagan Rome that it was one empire, and when Constantine moved the capital from the city of Rome in 330, suddenly the empire was divided into two parts. And then, right away, the east and the west are prophetically divided into three parts. Um, Con the, the emperor of the east um, divided up the whole empire between his three sons, and the pioneers understood that western Rome was divided up in three parts based upon... Um, the structure of their threefold government. And so when you're dealing with the trumpets that are taking the empire of Rome apart, uh, the revelator would refer to which a third part of the trees or a third part here or a third part there, being very specific about which part of the former, former Roman Empire was being dealt with. And in, in that disintegration, of course, uh, the empire disintegrated into ten kingdoms and seven, then turned it all over to the Pope of Rome. So here's Uriah Smith. Mr. King has very justly remarked on the subject of this prophecy. None could elucidate the text more clearly or expound them more fully than the task has been performed by Gibbon. 
The chapters of the skeptical philosopher that treat directly of the matter need but a text to be prefixed and a few unholy words to be blotted out to form a series of expository lectures on the eighth and ninth chapters of Revelation. Little or nothing is left for the professed interpreter to do but point to the pages of Gibbon. And so you see, here we are at the end of the world, and it's Seventh-day Adventists. We're generally, we don't know anything about the trumpets anymore. The pioneers understood them, but the reality, what the pioneers said, this wasn't hard prophecy. All you had to do was go to the historians, and the historians were clear. Very, it was very simple to see, and it still is. It's just we haven't been studying. So he continues on. The first sore and heavy judgment which fell on Western Rome in its downward course was the war with the Goths under Alaric, with who opened the way for the later inroads. The death of Theodosius, the Roman emperor, occurred in January 395, and before the end of the winter, the Goths under Alaric were in arms against the empire. Dropping down to the last paragraph, um, trusting most of, we, of us in here have Daniel and Revelation and have read it recently, but uh, those people that will be viewing this, they can read this. Uh, but the last paragraph says, The blast of the first trumpet has its location about the close of the 4th century and onward and refers to these desolating invasions of the Roman Empire under the Goths. Uh, the concluding sentence of the 33rd chapter of Gibbon's history is of itself a clear and comprehensive commentary for in winding up his own description of this brief but most eventful period, he concentrates as in a parallel reading the sum of the history and the substance of the prediction. But the words which preceded are not without their meaning. The public devotion of the age was impatience to exalt the saints and martyrs of the Catholic Church on the altars of Diana and Hercules. The union of the Roman Empire was dissolved. Its genius was humbled in the dust and the armies of unknown barbarians issuing from the frozen regions of the north had established their victorious reign over the fairest provinces of Europe and Africa. The last word, Africa, is the signal for sounding of the second trumpet. The scene changes from the shores of the Baltic to the southern coast of the Mediterranean or from the frozen regions of the north to the borders of burning Africa. And he's introducing us into Genseric, and we've discussed Genseric a little bit earlier. Um, this is the ships of Chittim of Daniel 11, verse 30. The second angel, which is Genseric. And the second angel sounded, and it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood, and a third part of the creatures which were in the sea, and had life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. The Roman Empire after Constantine was divided into three parts, and hence the frequent remark of third part of men, in allusion to the third part of the empire which un was under scourge, under the scourge, the division of the Roman Empire, Roman M Kingdom was made at the death of Constantine among his three sons, Constantius, Constantine II, and Constant. Constantius possessed the east and fixed his residence in Constantinople, the metropolis of the empire. Constantine II held Britain, Gaul, and Spain. Constans held Illyricum, Africa, and Italy. Of this well-known historical fact, Eliot as quoted by Albert Barnes in his notes on Revelation 12.4, says twice at least before the Roman Empire became divided permanently into two parts, the eastern and western, there was a tripartite division of the empire. The history, dropping down the next paragraph, the history illustrates of the sounding of the second trumpet evidently relates to the invasion and, and conquest of Africa and afterward of it, Italy by the terrible Genseric. His conquests were for the most part naval and uh, Dropping down the last sentence in that paragraph, in explain, explaining this trumpet, we are to look for some event which will have some particular bearing on the commercial world. This symbol used naturally leads us to look for agitation and commotion. Nothing but a fierce maritime warfare would fulfill the prediction if the sounding of the first four trumpets relates to four remarkable events which contributed to the downfall of the Roman Empire. The first trumpet refers to the ravages of the Goths under Alaric. In this, we naturally look for the next seceding act of invasion which shook the Roman power and conduced to its fall. The next great invasion was that of the terrible Genseric at the end of the Vandals. His career occurred during the years 428 to 468, and he was known as the tyrant of the seas, the third angel. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of the waters. And the name was called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. 
In the interpretation and application of this prophecy, all of this, by the way, I'm reading is Uriah Smith. We are brought to the third important event which resulted in the subversion of the Roman Empire. It is here premised that this trumpet has allusion to the desolating wars and furious evasions of Attila against the Roman power. In manner of his appearance, Attila, he strongly resembled a brilliant meteor flashing in the sky. He came from the east gathering his Huns and poured them down, as we shall see, with the rapidity of a flashing meteor, meteor suddenly on the empire. It is said, particularly last sentence, that the effect would be on the rivers and the fountains of water. If there is a literal application, or if, it's, as we was supposed in the case of the second trumpet, the language used was such as had reference to the portion of the empire that would be particularly affected by the hostile invasion, then we may suppose that this refers to those portions of the empire that abounded in rivers and streams, and more particularly those in which rivers and streams had their origin, for the effect was permanently in the fountains of water. As a matter of fact, the principal operations of Attila were on the regions of the Alps, where I assume Brother Samuel lives, somewhere close to and upon the portions of the empire whence the rivers flow down into Italy. The invasion of Attila is described by Mr. Gimmon in this general language. The whole breadth of Europe as it extends about 500 miles from the Euxine to the Adriatic was at once invaded and occupied and desolated by the myriads of barbarians whom Attila led into the field. The name of the star is called Wormwood, denoting bitter consequences. And then he begins to tell the bitter consequences as Attila brings Rome down. The fourth trumpet, the fourth angel sounded, and a third part of the sun was smitten, a third part of the moon, a third part of the stars, and a third part of them were darkened as the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. We understand that this trumpet symbolizes the career of Odiaser, the barbarian monarch who was so intimately connected with the downfall of Western Rome. We're here where Western Rome comes down. The symbols sun, moon, and stars, for they are undoubtedly here used. Notice, Western Rome now, he's going to tell you how they understood the Western Rome was divided into three parts. The symbols sun, moon, and stars, for they are undoubtedly here used as symbols, evidently denote the great luminaries of the Roman government, its emperors, senators, and consuls. Western Rome fell in 476. Still, however, though the Roman sun was extinguished, its subordinate luminaries shone faintly while the Senate and consuls continued. Next paragraph, fearful as were the calamities brought upon the empire by the first incursions of these barbarians, they were comparatively light as contrasted with the calamities which were to follow. They were but as the preliminary drops of a shower before the torrent which was soon to fall upon the Roman world. The three remaining trumpets are overshadowed with a cloud of woe as set forth in the following verses. Revelation 8, 13. And I beheld, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of the heavens, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices, of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. This angel is not one of the series of seven trumpet angels, but simply one who announces that the three remaining trumpets are woe trumpets on account of their more terrible events to transpire under their sounding. And if you took time, which um, I'm sure you all have, if you took time to look at the history books about the first four trumpets, they were terrible. <laughs> They were terrible, but Uriah Smith's pointing out here, they were nothing compared to the woes. Thus the next or fifth trumpet is the first woe, the sixth trumpet, the second woe, and the seventh. The last one in the series of seven trumpets is the third woe. Sorry about the color. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. For an exposition of this trumpet, we shall again draw from the writings of Mr. Keith. This writer truthfully says, there is scarcely so uniform an agreement among interpreters concerning any other part of the apocalypse as respecting the application of the fifth and sixth trumpets. Please note that there are many in Adventism that are doing one of two things wrong, maybe both. They're saying the pioneers are wrong about the trumpets, or they're saying the pioneers were right about the trumpets, but we're going to reapply them at the end of the world. 
there is scarcely so uniform an agreement among interpreters concerning any part of the book of Revelation, that's the apocalypse, as respecting the application of the fifth and sixth trumpets. This history is the strongest of all of it. It's the easiest to show. Or the first and second woes to the Saracens and Turks. It is so obvious that it can scarcely be misunderstood. Instead of a verse or two designating each, the whole of the ninth chapter of Revelation in equal portions is occupied with a description of both. The Roman Empire declined as it arose by conquest, but the Saracens and the Turks were the instruments by which a false religion became the scourge of an apostate church. And brothers and sisters, We've been suggesting to you that the two Romes, pagan Rome and papal Rome, prefigure, they give two testimonies about what happens to modern Rome. And what the pioneers understood is that the woes were the instruments by which a false religion became the scourge of an apostate church. And if you would take that down to modern Rome, then you would assume that God was going to raise up an instrument to deal with modern Rome that was going to be a scourge against that apostate church. And you would also, if you apply triple application of prophecy, know that that scourge would be radical Islam. And hence, instead of the fifth and sixth trumpets, like the former being designated by that name alone, they are called woes. Dropping down to the bold face. Uh, well, let me read right above it. A star fell from heaven unto earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. I, be, I agree with the pioneers. I mean, there's some different ideas about there what the key to the bottomless pit is. I, I'll go on record here to say that the key was this long, drawn-out war between pagan Rome and Persia that sapped the strength of both those powers, brought Persia into demise, but it brought pagan Rome into demise, even though it was the one that won the battle. And it was this power vacuum, providentially, that allowed for the rise of Islam. That's the key that opened the bottomless pit. That's how the pioneers understood it as well. While the Persian monarch contemplated the wonders of his art and power, he received an epistle from an obscure citizen of Mecca, inviting him to acknowledge Muhammad, Muhammad as the apostle of God. He rejected the invitation and tore the epistle in it is thus, exclaimed the Arabian prophet, that God will tear the kingdom and reject the supplication of Chosros. Placed on the verge of two empires of the east, Muhammad observed with secret joy the, pros the progress of mutual destruction. And in the midst of the Persian triumphs, he ventured to foretell that before many years should elapse, victory would again return to the banners of the Romans. He seen the Romans were going to win. At the time when this prediction is said to have been delivered, no prophecy could be more distant from its accomplishment. Ah, remember, Rome was grieved. And, it, and so what did it do when it was grieved? It paid the submission to the Persians. It was grieved. But in the meantime, it went up north and made this treacherous journey and came down out of the back door. Since the first 12 years of Herod, Heraclius announced the approaching dissolution of the empire. It was not like that designative of Attila on a single spot that the star fell, but up on the earth. Chosro subjugated the Roman possession is in Asia and Africa, and the Roman Empire at that period was reduced to the walls of Constantinople with the remnant of Greece, Italy, and Africa at some maritime cities from Tyre and onward. The king of Persia despised the obscure Saracen. Who's the obscure Saracen? Muhammad. And derided the message of the pretended prophet of Mecca. Even the overthrow of the Roman Empire would not have opened a door for Muhammadism or for the progress of the Saracenic armed propagators of an imposture. Though the monarch of the Persians and Chagan of the Avars, the successor of Attila, had divided between them the remains of the kingdoms of the Caesar. Chosros himself fell. The Persian and Roman monarchies exhausted each other's strength. Brothers and sisters, one thing to remember is that this long, drawn-out war, it, it's a history that applies to the end of the world, and it's a history that precedes the rise of Islam. Do you, do you know of a long, drawn-out war between two powers um, that preceded the rise of Islam? 
and before the sword was put in the hands of the false prophet, it was smitten from the hands of those who would have checked his career and crushed his power. The Roman emperor was not strengthened by the conquest which he achieved, and a way was prepared at the same time and by the same means for the multitudes of Saracens from Arabia, like a locust from the same region, who were propagating in their course the dark and delusive Mohammedan creed. <sighs> Dropping down to the bold face of that first paragraph, these robbers were the apostles of Muhammad. Their frantic valor had emerged from the desert, and in the last eight years of his reign, Hieraclius lost to the Arabs the same provinces which he had rescued from the Persians. He, he, the Romans had wasted all their strength against Persia, and they won, and then they could not defend against the hordes of Islam. The spirit of fraud and enthusiasm whose abode is not in the heavens was let loose on earth. The bottomless pit needed but a key to open it and that key was the fall of Kosros. The bottomless pit. This meaning, the meaning of this term may be learned from the Greek which is defined deep, bottomless, profound and may refer to any waste, desolate or uncultivated place. It is applied to the earth in its original state of chaos in this instance, it may appropriately refer to the unknown wastes, waste of the Arabian desert from the borders of which issued the hordes of Saracens like swarms of locusts. And the fall of Khosros, the Persian king, may well be represented as the opening of the bottomless pit. A false religion was set up, which although the scourge of transgression and idolatry, the scourge of transgression of idolatry, that's what Islam was, filled the world with darkness and delusion and swarms of Saracens like locust. Ever thought about what 20% of the world's population is today? Islam. <laughs> a lot of people in Islam today. The locust fit symbol of the air. Uh, a still more specific illustration may be given of the power like unto that of scorpions which was given them. Not only was their attack speedy and vigorous, but the nice sensibilities of honor which weighs the insult rather than injury sheds its deadly venom on the quarrels of the Arabs. Now notice what, notice what the pioneers noted about the attitude of warfare with the Arabs. An indecent action, a contemptuous word, can be expedited, expiated only by the blood of the offender. And such is their patient inveteracy that they expect whole months and years the opportunity of revenge. He's saying when, when Islam is going to deal with you, uh, they can wait a long time to do it till the time is right. And as they've tracked uh, the, the work of um, what Al-Qaeda, that's what they do. They take a year or two to develop just one strike. <laughs> they wait, and then they get you. Verse 5, their constant incursions into the Roman territory and frequent assaults on Constantinople itself were an unceasing torment through the empire. By unremitting attacks, grievously to afflict an idolatrous church of which the Pope was the head, their charge was to torment and then to hurt, but not to kill or utterly destroy. They were to torment the beast that was the beast that is. The marvel was that they did not. They did not kill it. The marvel was they did not kill it because they were prevailing. Verses 10 and 11. Thus far, Keith has furnished us with illustrations of the sounding of the first five trumpets, but we must now take leave of him and proceed to the application of the new feature of the prophecy here introduced, namely the prophetic periods. Their power was to hurt men five months. The question arises, what men were they to hurt five months? Undoubtedly the same they were to afterward to slay. The third part of men or the third part of the Roman Empire, the Greek division of it. When were they to begin their work of torment? The 11th verse answers the question. They had a king over them. From the death of Muhammad until near the close of the 13th century, the Mohammedans were divided into various factions under several leaders with no general civil government extending over, over them. Notice this, notice this. Near the close of the 13th century, Ottoman founded a government which has since been known as the Ottoman government or empire which grew until it extended over the principal Mohammedan tribes consolidating them into one grand monarchy. I want you to note here that they point out that for this first period of time as Islam was tormenting and hurting uh, the beast that was and the beast that is, they were, you know, they were random, they were scattered. But Ottoman, what's he do? He consolidates them into 
um, a civil structure. Um, he brings their religious fervor together with a civil government, um, which echoes of the term combination of church and state. When did Ottoman make his first assault on the Greek Empire? Ottoman first entered the territory of Nicodema on the 27th day of July, 1299. The calculation of some writers have gone upon the supposition that the period should begin with the foundation of the Ottoman Empire, but this is evidently an error. For they were not only to have a king over them, but they were to torment men for five months. The period of torment could not begin before the first attack of the tormentors, which was, as above stated, July 27, 1299. There's the beginning point for 150 years, followed by 391 years and 15 days that brings you to August 11, 1844. And here's, he's going to begin to quote Josiah Litch. This is Josiah Litch, quoted by Uriah Smith. And their power was to hurt men five months. Thus far, their commission extended to torment by constant depredations, but not politically to kill them. Five months, 30 days to a month, give us 150 days. And these days, being symbolic, signify... When you think about it, I know it's been a long week, and it's been a long day on top of a long week. And you've been listening to the same voice all week long. I don't know how you're doing it. But... What we're reading here, this is a sacred piece of information. This is the calculation of Josiah Litch that brought the angel down from heaven or participated. It's a historical document that's connected with Jesus coming down from heaven in Revelation 10. This is a significant document. And there is five months, 30 days to a month, uh, let me... Commencing July 27th, 1299, this is Josiah Litch, the 150 years reached to 1449. During that whole period, the Turks were engaged in an almost perpetual warfare with the Greek Empire, and yet without conquering it. They seized upon and held several of the Greek provinces, but still Greek independence was maintained in Constantinople. But in 1449, the termination of the 150 years, a change came, the history of which will be found under the succeeding trumpet, the second woe. Loose the four angels which were bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for not to, not to torment, but for to slay a third part of men. The first woe was to continue from the rise of the Mohammedans until the end of the five months. Then the first woe was to end, and the second woe began. <coughs> when the sixth <coughs> angel sounded, it was commanded to take off the restraints which had been imposed on the nation by which they were restricted to the work of tormenting men and their commission was enlarged so as to permit them to slay the third part of men. This command came from the four horns of the golden altar, the four angels. These were the four principal sultans of which the Ottoman Empire was composed, located in the country watered by the great river Euphrates. These sultans were situated at Aleppo, Iconium, Damascus, and Baghdad. Previously, they had been restrained, but God commanded, and they were loosed. In the year 1449, John Pelagos, the Greek emperor, died, but left no children to inherit his throne, and Constantine, his brother, succeeded to it. But he would not venture to ascend the throne without the consent of Amurath, the Turkish sultan, he therefore sent ambassadors to ask his consent, and he obtained it before he presumed to call himself sovereign. Let this historical fact be carefully examined in connection with the prediction given above. This was not a violent assault made on the Greeks by which their empire was overthrown. Now, Josiah Litch is pointing out here that the beginning of this time prophecy is what illustrates the, time, the end of the time prophecy. He's saying that a king gave away his kingdom, and then it was taken away, divided up shortly thereafter. He's, he's noting this dynamic and because he wants to show that this is how the time prophecy comes to an end. In this paragraph, he calculates the 391 years and 15 days in these two paragraphs, of which, as students of prophecy, we should know how to do without reading this anyway. But although the four angels were loosed by the voluntary submission of the Greeks, yet another doom awaited the seat of the empire. Voluntary submission. 
it was to the fire and the smoke and the sulfur, to the artillery and firearms of Muhammad that the killing of the third part of men, the capture of Constantinople by, and by consequent the destruction of the G Greek Empire was owing. By these, a third part of men were killed. Introduction of gunpowder. Uh, in a terrible color. Those verses express the deadly effect of the new mode of warfare introduced. It was by means of these agents, gunpowder, firearms, and cannons. This is, this is connected with Islam, gunpowder. You see Islam using explosives in the world today? In addition to the fire, smoke, and brimstone, which apparently issued out of their mouths, it is said that their power was also in their tails. It is a remarkable fact. The horse's tail is a well-known Turkish standard, a symbol of office and authority. We have more to say about that later. The supremacies of the Mohammedans over the Greeks was to continue, as already noted, 391 years and 15 days, commencing when the 150 years ended, July 27, 1449. The period would end August 11, 1840. Judging from the manner of the uh, commencement of the Ottoman supremacy, that it was by voluntary acknowledgement on the part of the Greek Empire that he reigned only by permission of the Turkish Sultan, we should naturally conclude that the fall or departure of the Ottoman independence would be brought about in the same way that at the end of the specified period, that is on uh, the 11th of August, 1840, the Sultan would voluntarily surrender his independence into the hands of Christian powers just as he had 391 years and 15 days before received it from the hands of the Christian Empire, Constantine VIII. The conclusion was reached and this application of the prophecy was made by Elder Josiah Litch in 1838, two years before the predicted event it was to occur. It was then purely a matter of calculation on the prophetic periods of Scripture. Now, however, the time has passed by, and it's proper to inquire what was the result, what result has been, whether such events did transpire according to the previous calculation. The matter sums itself up in the following inquiry and goes on to show that it took place um, right on schedule. The, the sultan accepted the invitation, intervention of the great powers, and thus made a voluntary surrender of the question into their hands. And here is the conclusion of Uriah Smith. This day, this day, the period of the 391 years and 50 days allotted to, the continuance of the Ottoman power ended, and where was the sultan's independence? Gone. Who had the supremacy of the Ottoman Empire in their hands? The four great powers. And that empire has existed ever since only by the sufferance of these Christian powers. Now, you go back in to go into the great controversy where Sister White speaking about this, and the only thing you can say that is lifted out of Uriah Smith and put in the great controversy, if it was, and doesn't threaten me if Sister White liked the way he said this sentence, was this sentence. Thus was the prophecy fulfilled to the very letter. She doesn't describe that history that way. Um, but there's an argument about that. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sabbath. Uh, we thank you for the presence of your spirit, your angels, on this holy day. And we ask that uh, this day would be a high Sabbath for us where we receive a double blessing, where you're with each one of us individually from beginning to end, speaking to our hearts and minds. Lord, we thank you for this week um, that we've spent considering your word, and um, we thank you for this um, conclusion of this week. We've just went through some history that uh, has an impact on end-time Baba prophecy and bringing clarity to what's going on in the world. We ask that you'd bless us with the wisdom that only comes from your Holy Spirit, that we can understand that history in such a way as to see how it outlines the days in which we're living. And then more than that, we ask that you would allow this history that we're living in right now to be a tool of conviction to bring and keep each one of us at the foot of the cross. Lord, we lift up our families that aren't represented here, that are represented here, but that aren't here at homes, wherever they might be. We ask that you bless them this Sabbath. Watch over and protect them. And we know that there are people traveling here um, to be here tomorrow. Uh, we ask that you do the same for them. Give them traveling mercies. And as we break here and have um, fellowship with one another, we ask that you would bless that fellowship this evening until we um, retire. And we ask for your rest 
your blessed rest the night that we might wake up refreshed in the morning and uh, enter into the, the rest of the Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>